So last week you saw me on film talking about discontent and we're talking about these painful emotions that people coming out of complex trauma don't like. And so tonight I want to talk about stress. I think there's probably not a week that goes by at React where I don't get questions from clients who are stressed out and they're not coping very well with their stress and a lot are feeling very vulnerable to a relapse because it's just getting too much. And over the last 15 years, I would say that stress is one of the biggest triggers for people that leads to a relapse. That's how big it is. And, and the reason, in my mind, it is so big is because of complex trauma. One of the 60 characteristics of complex trauma was complex trauma people don't handle stress well. And we talked about that very briefly when we were going through the series of the 60 characteristics. So tonight, I want to just develop this topic of stress and help you understand it and hopefully give you some tools that will be practical for you and helpful for you as you deal with stress in your life. So let me just begin with a definition. So stress is nothing more than your body responding to demands placed on it. And it's not just your physical body, it's your emotional body, it's your brain, so your intellectual, emotional, and physical, any demand requires energy. And that demand feels like a pressure on us, and we call that stress. And so we all live with that. That's part of life. So we break stress into two categories. One is eustress, and the other is distress. And eustress is good stress. It is positive things are happening to you. You get a new job. Your child marries a wonderful person and you're all pumped up, but afterwards you're exhausted because it takes a toll on you. It requires energy. So eustress is a, the good things of life, but it's important to realize they still put a pressure on us and distress is the negative things in life that we have to deal with. So the reality for all of us is that stress is part of life. Now, I don't know if you ever thought about the fact that we actually need some stress in order to be healthy. You imagine if you had zero stress, you'd sleep 24-7. Why bother getting out of bed? Nothing to do, no demands. And life would become very boring, very unfulfilling. And you'd after a while go, what's the purpose of living? To sleep? And so we need a little bit of stress to get us up in the morning, to motivate us to do what we need to do, even though it might be something we don't want to do. But stress is a good thing that is part of life. We get periods of intense stress, and then we get times... Any time that has danger takes stress to an extra intense level. Any time that has big responsibilities takes stress to an extra difficult level. And any major loss or change, those are your biggest stress events. And so what I have found over the years in working with addicts in recovery is most have a whole bunch of losses they never dealt with. Most have a whole bunch of change that they're now facing, a whole bunch of difficulties that is now part of their life. And so their stress is just there big time, and it's part of early recovery. And so if you don't understand that, it can lead you to all kinds of problems. So I put here at the bottom of this slide, you get stress from actual events, but I want you to think about you also get stress from how you perceive an event. So if somebody says, you say hi to somebody and they go, hi. And then all day you're stressing out that they don't like you anymore. Maybe they were just choking on their breakfast or something. 
and, and they don't they, they like you, but your perception now has your stress magnified. So your perception is big. Then another re- issue in recovery is you start getting memories from your past of things that have never been resolved. And so now you're trying to deal with all of that crap from the past on top of what's happening in the present. And then you got stuff you know that's coming up in the future. And so stress, past, present, future, all piled into the now. And so recovery is awesome, yes. And stress is part of that. And so to help you understand why it's so significant, i got to take you to the complex trauma piece. So on the left there, you see this line with a whole bunch of markings on it. On the bottom is an infant. On the top is an adult. That is your stress responsibility tool line for handling problems. So it's important to understand that a child comes into the world with zero ability to handle stress, zero ability to handle problems. They have to be taught that, and that comes usually from parents. And so if a parent is doing a good job, the child adds tool after tool after tool. They learn to walk, they learn to ride a bike, they learn to tie their shoe, they learn to play with a friend, they learn to share, they learn to clean up. Tool, 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 tool. So hopefully by the time they are an adult, they have a great big toolbox for handling all kinds of problems. And they can go into adult life and they're not going to have tons of stress because they got a really good toolbox. They're going to have stressful times, but they have tools to handle that stress. Okay? Now enter complex trauma. You face problems and there's nobody there to teach you a tool. In fact, the ones who are supposed to teach the tool were creating the problems. And so what was the option for a child when they don't have a tool to handle that problem? Fight, flight. You go into survival mode. So if you picture yourself, just take about the third or the fourth line up. And let's say that's where your toolkit of healthy tools stop being added to. And let's say you were about eight years old at that point in time. And then, because nobody was giving you tools to handle the problems going into teenage years, you went into survival mode, fight, flight. Your toolkit is still that of an eight-year-old. So what happens when you come into recovery, you start facing these problems, and you'll panic, I don't have tools, let's go back to fight, flight. And you relapse. And so that's why stress is one of the major causes of relapse is because you never had a toolkit that was healthy and you use fight flight as your toolkit for handling stress. And so what recovery is, is learning new tools for handling problems that you should have got as a child but didn't. And now you need to learn so that you can handle more and more problems, difficulties, and then stress affects you less and less because you have a better and better toolbox. And that becomes the challenge. Now, i got to add a couple difficulties. So if you've been at React, you know I teach you something, then I'll say one more thing, and then I'll say one more thing, and then one more thing, and I'll just keep adding until I got you all discouraged. So what happens is not only did anybody not give you any tools, you have this what we call low stress tolerance. Or it gets called distress tolerance problems. In other words, people from complex trauma, they don't sit in uncomfortable emotions very well. Because all of a sudden their legs bouncing and they're going, okay, something bad's going to happen, something bad's going to happen, I don't have tools, let's get out of here. And that is that distress intolerance. And so what that had to have for a person is when a child was in a situation that they no longer had tools for, that triggered a brain circuit that said, fight, flight, freeze. Isolate, get angry, turn negative, run away, But it set up brain circuit after brain circuit after brain circuit 
that you were trying to find tools to cope with these problems you couldn't handle. And all of you understand that. Then what had to happen, if there was a lot of stress or a lot of danger or big problems, is as soon as you saw that, the brain released cortisol to give you energy to fight or flight. But with that came this nanosecond, zero to a hundred escalation of emotions, which usually include anger, which usually include fear, panic. And that now is built into that trigger. So when you get a trigger, it's not, what brain circuit will I choose to follow today? Let me think about that. It's nanosecond, I'm gone. And I'm gone so fast, you can't even catch me no matter how hard you try, because I go zero to a thousand in a nanosecond. And that becomes the challenge in recovery. It's changing your behaviors in a nanosecond. When you're triggered to go all the old circuits that lead and end in using or self-destructive behaviors. And that's why this is such a big issue. Because it's not easy in that nanosecond to make a change. And you're usually not going to do it right the first time or the second time or the third time. But what I tell clients is this. Learn from each time you didn't get it right. Learn what could I do the next time in that nanosecond to choose a different path. And that is super hard, especially when you got cortisol and adrenaline pumping in your body and you are on high alert. So recovery is making choices in a nanosecond which create new brain circuits. And that is possible. It is difficult, but it is possible. Now let me give you this. When I w give you this stress test, I'll tell you the results up front. If you have over 200, it says you are in danger of physical health problems. The average test score for an addict in early recovery is around 500. And part of what you have to understand is when I ask them, with 500, do you feel stressed? They go, no, I feel normal. I go, that's the point. When you live in danger, where you're stressed all the time, that becomes your normal. And you don't even think you're stressed. But yet it's still working deep inside of you. And so part of what is happening in recovery is realigning your stress meter to a healthy place. But do you want to know what that begins to feel like? That feels boring. Nothing exciting is happening here. Nobody's getting their head blown off. Nobody's about to cheat on anybody. What's going on? This is dull. So you're not just realigning your stress meter, you're realigning your definition of a fulfilling life. So you've got a lot of pieces now to this stress puzzle that are important and all play a part, but they're all challenging and difficult. So what I do with clients is I want them to become aware of how stress affects them. And so most of you, if you grew up in stress, it happens without you even realizing what it's doing. It happens at a subconscious level. So I say, okay, let's start looking for early warning signs that stress is building. So before we get to the trigger point, and I got some stress building in my life, a new job, pressures with money, pressures with partner, pressures with children, and it's building. What are the early warning signs? Trouble sleeping. Big one. Or you want to sleep all the time. You don't want to face life anymore. Or you feel your blood pressure going up. And you feel your heartbeat at times. And you get tight muscles and headaches. Some people with stress start getting dreams. And they have trouble sleeping because of nightmares and stuff like that. So that's a physical thing. Then your brain is affected. So all of a sudden you can't turn your brain off. 
It is just going, going, going. And you're worrying about this and that. And what about, and what about, and what about? And your brain is there going crazy. But not only that, your brain is beating yourself up. Saying you're a loser, you should know how to do this, you shouldn't be so affected by this. And you're starting the beating up stuff. And then your brain says, while we're feeling stressed now, let's jump to the worst case scenario. We're going to screw up anyways, let's get it over with. And so your brain plays tricks on you. And it distorts your reality and gets you jumping to the worst case scenario. And then some of you, when you feel stressed, you become the most negative, critical, complaining people in the world. You find fault with everybody, everything. Guess what that does? That creates more stress. Guess what worst case scenario does? Creates more stress. So you see your solutions that you think are going to solve your stress are actually making it worse. And that's part of the problem. And then some of you, and I love talking with clients at times when they are under stress, because I always picture in my mind a pinball machine. And ball here, squirrel, squirrel, ball. And you, okay, I got to keep track of seven conversations now in this one conversation. And you can't focus. Your brain is bouncing around. You can't think straight. And some call it brain chatter. So you got physical warning signs, you got stuff happening in your thinking, and then you get other emotions besides stress. Stress people become grouchy, irritable people that are very impatient and anger is very close to the surface. Then you start to feel overwhelmed. I can't handle this, this is too much, I'm going to lose it, I'm going to lose it. And you go to hopeless. And some of you go to hopeless really fast. And then... Fear starts to build. Something bad's going to happen. I'm going to screw up. I'm going to fail. And, and fear, fear. I'm going to look stupid. People are going to judge me. All of those things. And then some of you, you start to feel the lack of control in your world. And that lack of control creates fear and more stress. Because you can just feel yourself losing control. And then... Some people go now into uh, deer in the headlights. Let's just start shutting her down. You get that catatonic, you're staring straight ahead, but there's a blank. And you're just shutting down. And sometimes that can happen without you even realizing it's happening. And that's how dangerous stress can be. And then some of you go to sitting on the pity pot saying, poor me, my life sucks, everybody's against me, too much. And then that just creates more stress and you relapse. So you got thoughts happening, physical things happening, emotions happening. Now all of that translates into what you do with your actions. What behaviors you do. So some start to isolate. Some when you're stressed, instead of doing the problem solving and fixing the things causing stress, you reorganize the bathroom cupboard for the 50th time that week. <laughs> just because it keeps you busy. But you're avoiding everything. And so you have distraction after distraction. You can't sit still. Some of you begin eating everything in sight. You organize stuff that doesn't even matter. You talk nonstop or you don't talk at all. And you drive your partner crazy or they drive you crazy. So stress starts to affect our behavior. So you see what happened? It affects your mind your body, your emotions, and your behavior. Every part. But here's what I want you to see. Do you realize that every one of those responses took you to a more negative place? It didn't solve the thing. So when you get all making sure the bathroom cupboard's organized for the 50th time, that gives you instant relief of stress. But it makes things worse long term. So it's an instant fix that's actually a bad fix because it's making everything worse. But so what have you done? You've gone back to the limbic brain, the child's brain that says, I want instant relief. I don't want to think long term. I don't want to play the tape out to the end. I just want instant relief. And that's why many people, if they try to handle stress and it's building and after a while it's not working, 
they say, I need a holiday from life called a relapse. I'll just relapse for a week, then I'll get back on and I'll get back on my job. So what are you doing there? Your only tool for dealing with stress is a holiday called a relapse. That doesn't work long term. But that's all that your brain has available to it. So that's stress in general. That's the early warning signs. Now I want you to think about we are actually usually our own worst enemy when it comes to stress. So we create stress for ourselves. We don't need stressful events or anything like that. We can do a good, good enough job on ourselves, on our own. So I'll quickly go through these. We set unrealistic expectations of ourselves and others. I got to do everything perfectly. Well, that's stressful to try to make that realist, unrealistic expectation reality. I expect everybody to be the perfect friend. And if they're not, they have a bad day, then I'm stressed out about that. So unrealistic expectations. Then complex trauma people say the only way not to get hurt is to control everybody and everything. Imagine how much stress that adds to your life. Trying to control. And then addiction isn't about planning and getting organized and being disciplined in your daily life. Addiction is all about do whatever you feel like. And you do whatever you feel like and don't plan. You just end up creating more stress. And then you go, oh, I'm, I'm feeling like a little boy today. I'm in my limbic brain. I don't feel like doing stuff, so I'll procrastinate. I'll just pile it up for tomorrow. And then tomorrow I'll pile it up for the next day. And that pile is going to keep getting bigger, but I don't want to deal with it. So we do that to ourselves. And then we're afraid to say no to people. They say, can I get a ride? Would you help me here? And... We just let everybody come into our life. Do you imagine how much stress that is? If we just said no, we get rid of a lot of stress called mixed up people. And then we're drawn to all these unhealthy relationships. And what, bring, what happens with them? Drama, drama, stress, stress. And we just bring that on. Then we get all wrapped up with it. Everybody thinks of us. Oh, I heard somebody said I'm a jerk. Oh, I better go find out. And we spend all day chasing down Facebook and everybody we can think of to prove to the world we're not a jerk. <laughs> we just proved we were a jerk by doing all of that. But we do that. And that's pretty stressful. And then we do something wrong. We lie. And our little conscience says, you need to make that right. And we say, shut up, conscience. That's stressful, shutting that conscience up. And then we live with fear of failure, fear of change, fear of the unknown, constant anxiety. And constant anxiety takes a lot of energy. And that's called stress. And then we hang on to these resentments. That's stressful. We get all negative and we think the worst, stressful. Self-pity, stressful. And then we get, live with this thing, I can't be a burden to anybody. So i got to handle all my problems all by myself. I can never ask for help. Well, that's stressful. And then we have this addiction to chaos. So normal feels too boring. Let's spice it up a little bit. Let's create a little disaster. And that will make life exciting again. Stress. So you just see right there how we do it to ourselves. So what I want clients to realize is, yes, circumstances create stress. But out of complex trauma comes ways of coping with life that create more stress. And that's what we can control now and begin to change. So let me give you some of the practical things that we can do in order to begin coping with stress in a healthy way. So we talked about boundaries. Learning to say no. Starting to be selective about who I let into my life at a closer relationship. Such an important skill in recovery. And then stop and think through what really matters in my life. Does the bathroom cupboard have to look absolutely perfect? Are there maybe more important things 
Do I need to be running around at all these other things? Think through your priorities. Because once you can get your priorities sorted out, then you can say no easier because it doesn't allow you to accomplish your priorities if you're doing that other thing. So getting your priorities is figured out is really important. So if an athlete was planning to go to the next Olympics, they would say, if I want to win, i got to say no to partying. i got to say no to a lot of friends. i got to say no to a lot of junk food. And you go, wow, that's kind of harsh. He says, but i got a priority. i got a goal. And that's the only way I'm going to meet it. And it simplifies my life. And then plan. We encourage clients to make a list of things to do. And then if you say, I got to get a job, don't just panic and say, oh, it's too much. Break it down. Okay, I got to write a resume. Got to get some job papers or want ads. I got to go to some type of employment agency. Break it down into steps. And then it becomes more doable. And talk to people about what you're dealing with, what you're facing. Because sometimes you're going, I don't know what the healthy response is now. I don't know what I should do next. And they can often help you and they might say, you know what? I can actually do this for you and help carry some of your load. Next one, self-care. I think everybody that lives in a stressful environment, and we live in one, realizes at some point that the key to dealing with stress well is I got to be fairly healthy physically. I got to be quite healthy emotionally and spiritually. So we talk about spiritual fitness, emotional fitness, and physical fitness. So I need to be in a healthy enough place to deal with all this stuff. I don't know if you've had times in your life where your life is really going through a lot of chaos, but you're calm on the inside because you're emotionally healthy, spiritually healthy, and all of a sudden you're able to cope a whole lot better. And so the solution that a complex child has to stress is fix my external world. Make my problems go away. Healthy growth is the solution to a stressful world is fix my internal world. If I get that right, yes, I'll still have to make changes in my external world, but it's a big part of coping is a healthy internal world. Then, learn healthy escapes or hobbies. If you've been an addict for 30 years, probably your hobby has been drinking or using for 30 years. Now you need to find enjoyable things. And that's important in recovery because everybody in recovery says you've got to take this seriously, and you do. And you've got to go to meetings, you've got to be disciplined, and you do. But recovery is not just work, 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 and no play. You have to find a balance between hard work and rest and enjoyable activities. And that reduces a lot of stress. And then learn to talk to yourself. And coach yourself through. So if you feel the panic rising, you say, calm down, we can handle this. I got some new tools I've learned. I got some people I can talk to. And coach yourself through that. And then learn how to solve problems and make decisions by weighing out the pros and the cons. What are the good things about this decision, possible decision? What are the potentially bad things? What about this decision? And learn how to think through problem solving. And then understand that you will have difficult times. You're going to do all the right things and it's not going to make it all go away. So there will always be an element of stress where you just have to sit in some of it. And that's not fun, but part of growth is learning stress tolerance, learning to tolerate distress. And so you can begin to do that. And then we talked about learning to ask for help. Now, let me just end by saying this. What I find for a lot of people who get all stressed out and they come and talk to me, often it reveals deeper issues that they need to look at. So they come all stressed and I realize you don't set boundaries very well. 
And then they go, I don't set boundaries because I don't like myself and I don't want anybody mad at me. Oh, okay, we got shame issues that are behind a big part of this stress. So when you look at your stress, ask yourself, what else is going on underneath that stress that's causing me to be afraid? That's causing me to want to get out of here through fight or flight. So I think stress is a topic we all will be learning about and growing in until the day we die. But we can learn a lot in early recovery of basic tools for dealing with life so that stress doesn't become the thing that takes us out over and over again. So I got thinking about David, who is Israel's greatest king, and so the Jewish Israel's flag is the star of David. And so I thought of a time in his life that many of you will relate to. So let me just give you a little bit of background about David. So David, if you aren't familiar with him, when he was just a teenage boy, this prophet or preacher of God came and anointed him with oil and said, God's chosen you to be the next king of Israel. And then that David went and he killed Goliath, if you're familiar with the David and Goliath story. And then King Saul, who was the ruler at that time, heard about David and he became paranoid and jealous and he began to try and get David killed. And repeated attempt trying to get David killed. And it's quite a lengthy thing. So what David eventually had to do was run for his life out into the desert and live in caves. And he stayed there for 10 years. And what he was doing was running from cave to cave just to keep hidden from King Saul. And that 10 years, I call it God's university. So most of us know what it is to get education. And God says, okay, you got lots of head knowledge. I'm not ready to make you the king yet or use you in a great way till you go through my university. And his university for David was 10 difficult, difficult years. But those 10 years became crucial in David's development. He developed the skills in those 10 years to become a great king. He wouldn't have got those skills any other way. He developed loyal supporters that stood with him all through his reign. And he developed a relationship with God where he learned that God was trustworthy and faithful. And so those 10 most difficult years became David's best years for learning life and learning about God. So I want to take you to the first cave that he goes to when he first flees to the desert at the very beginning of the 10 years or the beginning of God's university. So I'm going to read it. David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. What you need to understand is that David has just made a, out of fear, he made a decision that has got a bunch of people killed because of his decision made out of fear. So he feels terrible, but that has sent Paul or King Saul's dogs chasing after him. So he goes to the cave of Adullam. Then he's sitting there in his brothers and his father's household, which meant their wives and their children. And they were all now in danger because Saul's going to go after them as a way to get David. So they hear that David's in the cave of Adullam and they went down to him there. And then uh, the word gets out and all those who are in distress or debt or discontented, that means miserable people, they gathered around David. And so because King Saul was losing it because of his paranoia, he was becoming an abusive king. And he was making life unbearable for people. So they start running to the desert as well 
And they hear about David, and so they show up at David's cave. And they ask him to become their leader. About 400 men were there with him, and then we're told in the next chapter that 200 more men come, so that's 600 men, plus their wives and their children. Guess how many David had in his little cozy cave? 2,000 people saying, David, we're in a desert, but would you please feed us three square meals a day? And, and Saul's chasing all of us. Would you please keep all of us safe in a desert? Now just stop and think about that. So imagine tomorrow, 2,000 people show up and say, you're our chosen leader, take care of us. And you're trying to hide and run for your own life. And imagine the stress of that. So David's dealing with his own guilt. He's just got some people killed because of a bad decision. He doesn't want more lies on his conscience right now. If Saul finds him and wipes out all 2,000, that would just be too much. So his first inclination is, I don't want people right now. I want to go solo. But then keeping 2,000 people safe. How do you hide 2,000 people in a desert? That's a lot of stress. You're thinking all the time and you got scouts out trying to find out where Saul's soldiers are because he was sending his army to look for David. And then you got to get food. So what David did is he started protecting because Saul was going crazy. He started protecting farmland from Saul and then the farmers out of gratitude would give him food. So he's got people working now trying to protect, but stay hidden from Saul so they have enough food to eat. Now, you imagine if you had 2,000 miserable people who are whining and grumping and complaining, wanting to move in with you, how annoying that would be? Let's have breakfast together. Negative, 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 negative. That would wear you out. That would drive me crazy. Then you want to just have a moment to yourself where you can just calm down and think and relax, you don't get that with 2,000 people. So David's privacy is almost pretty much gone. And now he's leading these people who are angry. They got anger issues because they got a lot of bad stuff happen to them. They're wounded. They're very needy people. You see stress, 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 stress. Ten years of that. David had. Now, if God sent you an email and said, I'm sending you 2,000 miserable people, take care of them and live with them, what email would you send back to God? <laughs> God, where is your brain these days? You're not doing a good job of running the world, especially my life. And we go, what's the point of this, God? This isn't fun. God says, this is university. Well, I hate your university. I quit. And David was there. Why? What was the benefit of 10 years of that? So stop and think of that, okay? If David had become king and he didn't be, wasn't exposed to all those people that had been mistreated by the past king, he might have fallen into the same thing and mistreated people. But because he had all those broken people who have been mistreated by authority, he says, wow, I'm thankful for this experience because now I know what life is like through their eyes. So that when I become a king, I never want to abuse my authority. And David never abused his authority. Amazing. And then he developed these amazing skill of tact and conflict resolution and problem solving, and managing personalities. And guess what you get when you're a king? You get a lot of different personalities and conflict that you got to manage. And David learned that in the caves. And then, it would have been first David's response, I hate difficult people. Difficult, miserable people make me miserable, and they're a pain, and I have a great hatred for them. Thank you very much. Do you want to know what happened over 10 years? He loved those people. 
he fell in love with people nobody else would love. And he developed a heart for broken people. And then he grew as a leader. Now he had to organize people to protect, protect farms. He had to have scouts. He had to train people to fight. He had to organize and do administrative stuff. He had to talk to people about their problems. He had to listen. He learned how to be a leader. And he learned administration, people skills, leadership skills, fighting skills, all of that in God's university. And then David had some deep wounds of his own. He had been, King Saul had been his surrogate father. King Saul was now trying to kill him. Nobody had let him talk about his pain up till now. And now he had people who understood what he was going through. And David was able to heal with wounded healers. Do you realize that most effective healers are wounded healers? And David became that. And then, 10 years, sitting in unpleasant circumstances, waiting. One of the toughest things for people in complex trauma is patience. And God says, David, if you're ever going to be effective in life, you've got to wait for my timing. And we stamp our foot and say, well, we want you to cooperate with our timing. And David learned that God's timing always is wise. And so what came out of that? Amazing things. Now let me just take that a little bit further. I think for David, being deeply hurt by Saul, the man you had looked up to, the man you had seen as a surrogate father, who now turned against you and tried to kill you. Do you imagine how easy it would have become to become full of anger, resentment, bitterness, hatred? That event, that trauma event for David could have shaped him to be one of the angriest men in the world. And David made a choice. I have been wounded deeply. Will I let it make me bitter or better? And David said, I'm going to take this pain and not go down the resentment anger route. I'm going to choose to forgive. I'm going to choose to love. I'm going to choose to let go and grow. And do you want to know where love grows the most? When it's been wounded. And you choose to love the people that are difficult or that have wounded you. That takes love to a whole new level. And so David never would have grown in love if he had never been in a cave. In God's university. Realize how easy it would have been for David to just make life all about him. Feeling sorry for himself. Wanting everybody to take care of him. In the middle of pain, he gave. In the middle of pain, he didn't become self-centered. He became more loving. And that is an amazing thing. He learned forgiveness. And then he learned to trust God. Isn't that an amazing thing? The 10 worst years of his life became the 10 best years of his life. Because he learned lessons in them that didn't just teach him academic lessons, they shaped who he was and made him a great man. If David had become a king without those 10 years, he probably would have failed as a king. And so, what do we need in our life? God's university. So I, I tell clients all the time, when you come to React or Finding Freedom, what you hear academically, that's only part of university. God says, I'm going to put you in a treatment center with a bunch of annoying people. Learn how to get along. <laughs> I'm going to put you with people that hurt you. Learn how to forgive. I'm going to put you in situations where you want out now, and I'm going to say, just sit in it and be patient. And you're going to grow, and you're going to grow, and you're going to develop skills, and out of all of that, you will become more effective, more healthy, and more happy. And David needed university God's way. And so we hate pain. Pain was given as a way to alert us that something is wrong so we could resolve it. But sometimes what I want you to see is God puts us in stress and pain to say, the thing I want to change now is you, not the outside. You have to grow up inside. 
You have to develop character qualities inside. And you want to know the other thing that came out of this? We're told throughout David's life he had 60 men who became his bodyguard, who became his top soldiers, who fought till the death to protect David. Do you want to every one of those 60 men were with David in the cave? They came to him as broken people. They learned to trust David. They found healing as they worked with David. David became a man they respected and were willing to die for. You develop communities of love in caves where people heal in a healthy way. You create a loyalty and a family that we all need. And so it wasn't just benefits to David. It's those benefits to David splashed over onto others' lives and created healing in them and then a family that then led to great changes in the world. So we're in God's university. Some days we hate it. Some days we're mad at God. That's all right. He can put up with that. Some days David journaled and he was mad. Other days he was depressed. Other days he was crying. Other days he was mad at God. But he wrote it down and he got it all out and then he came back to trusting God again and he learned the lessons. And that's what I hope we all do. Let's pray.